The Surrounded by D'Arcy McNichol. Chapter 6 The grain was being cut on Max Leon's ranch. In the morning he put on his riding boots and followed the men with their two binders into the field. He rode a white mare with a well-shaped head. After an oiling and a last tightening up of the first binder was set to work. As the white arms revolved, they tossed in the, long, the tall grain stalks against the flying sickle and on to the moving aprons. A bundle collected at the side was tied with twine and kicked into the carriage. A second bundle followed, then a third. The wheat was heavy and the bundles came through quickly. The second binder started into action. Max sat astride his mare and watched, and then he trotted up to the machines and rode alongside for a while. The mare disliked the noise and the motion of the whirling arms and had to be coaxed and scolded by turns. This had not continued for hours before the leading machine stopped with a banging noise. God damn, Max exploded. I never knew one of these damn things to run yet. What's the matter? It was a broken drive chain, a small matter. That's all right, Max, the driver said calmly. I got some extra links. In a few days, that grain will be too ripe, and you've got to keep moving. Then he rode back to the house. At the kitchen door, he called for Agnes. Send your boys to the field with a jug of water. Tell them to stay till the water's drunk up and fetch more. they got to tend to that while the men are working, or I'll give them my whip. Agnes looked around the yard. They're not here, she said. Then where are they? Fishing, maybe. I don't know. Well, damn it all. Find them. they got to bring water to the men. He scowled. It was no good telling her to look for the boys. He started up the creek himself. He looked back and saw Agnes had already gone into the house. It was none of her affair. He swore out loud. In the timber, there was quiet. While the mare drank at the creek, he dismounted and drank too. Lying on his stomach, he followed a trail through the brush. It was some time before he found the boys. They were lying quietly on a pile of driftwood in the center of the stream, waiting for a shy trot to get into position to be speared. They had already brought up several in that way. Our child handled the spear and the boys watched carefully. They would have to try it later and they didn't want to blunder and be laughed at. They were too engrossed in this occupation to see or hear anything. Max rode up close before he shouted. The boys were on their feet in a second and ready to run. Why don't you stay home, Max called. You gotta carry water to the field. Men are working. We want to fish. You fish and run in the woods all summer. Now come and work like men for a few days. It won't hurt you. The boys stood looking at each other. Max had not spoken to our child. Come on now. You can get behind me on the mare. That old whitey will buck us off, Narcissus pr protested. You're not afraid of that. You're buckaroos. We don't want to go back, Mike cried. Our seals got to come too, he added. Our child can stay and be a buck indian you two come and learn something you'll get good pay jump up behind me now the offer attracted them there was pay and they could ride the white mare if they had tried that without permission they'd have their necks broke they stood there debating then our child spoke yes you two go and help the fish will stay in the creek he did not look up to see how his words would be received but max gave him a quick inquiring glance Mike and Narcissus needed no further urging and crawled up behind Max. The white mare switched her tail and tried to walk sideways. When she had been coaxed enough, she went all right. Make her run, Mike cried, and at the same time kicked her with his heel. The mare turned back her ears and started through the woods in a gallop. You little devils, keep your feet still. When they had disappeared along the trees, our child got to his feet. For a moment, he looked in, indecisive, then he started down the trail. He expected contempt from Max. He was accustomed to it, but since he had come back, come home, this time it bit into him as it had never before. Max was stupid if he could not see better, if he did not understand. That afternoon, one of the binders broke down again, and Max had to go for repairs. It was in a range. Ta, that's all right. George Moser tried to calm him. You always have a few stops when you start harvesting. Things will run smooth now, you see. In his own household, things were going smoothly enough, and the shopkeeper was inclined to see the world in a cheery mood. For two days now, Mrs. Moser had not said a word about going home to her parents, and it had begun to seem as 
if she were ready to act on his advice of taking things as they came. If he had felt any res resentment toward Max Leon, the other day he had forgotten it. He still had hopes of winning the Spaniard's friendship. Won't you step into my office and have a drink? He had met Max out in the store with people all around, and this invita invitation was whispered. Max either did not hear or pretended not to hear. He was grumbling. Goddamn farm machinery. They make it out of paper. They rob you when you buy it, but that's not enough. They go on robbing you to keep it repaired. Bunch of robbers. When you run cattle, all you need is a horse. Only you must also have as much sense as the horse. Psaw. That's all right. Things will run smoothly now, Mr. Moser repeated his consoling observation, but the invitation to have a drink he did not repeat. After all, a man had to have some pride. The second binder was making its round of the field. Sometimes, as it started up, a slight raise in the ground was whirling of its sickle could be heard plainly, and then, as it dipped down, the sound faded away. Max stopped his car in the lane and walked across the field with his repair parts. He glanced shrewdly at the width of the cut and estimated how long the second binder had been idle while the men talked. You sure lucky they had spare parts. What we was laying five to one, they'd have to telegraph for it, the driver said. The afternoon was slipping away and the heat grew less intense. Over against the timber, the shadows lay long and cool. The machine was repaired and started up. The men who were bunching the sheaves had made a circle in the field, and now they were approaching Max as he stood watching the flying arms of the reaper. He turned toward the men, and something made him blink. Our child was working with them. Max's mouth dropped open in amazement. He walked over and watched our child pick up a bundle under each arm and place the two on end, leaning against each other for support. When he had brought others and completed a bunch, Max spoke. Why didn't you say you'd help? Now I got an extra man. You didn't ask me. That made Max snort. You got eyes. You saw this field ready to be cut. You saw the men start, but you didn't ask me. Max let his mouth hang open without saying a word. Then he let the scorn go out of his voice. He was curious. Where'd you learn to shock wheat? It's nothing to learn. I just watched a few times. Is it all right? Sure. Hell yes, it was all right. Well, if you're going to help, I can let a man go. There's no use having an extra man to feed. He had become businesslike. Where's those kids? They'd been carrying water? They had gone for a fresh jug. Our child resumed his work and Max walked away. He did not mean to make too much of this. It might not last. He went to his car, standing in the lane. Suddenly, he began to laugh. Hell, I didn't ask him. What do you know about that? Have you got a good supper? He asked Agnes. The men were, are working hard, and you want to feed them good. He looked into her pots on the stove to see what was cooking. You must keep it clean around here, he ended. Agnes went about noiselessly in her moccasined feet and paid no attention to Max. Little Annie sat in the doorway, nursing a stick of wood wrapped in an old shawl. From the house, Max walked to the creek, and he seemed full of thought. There was a fall of three or four feet over a ledge of rock. He had often planned to lay a dam there and build a small grist meal. The steam ran more than enough water for the power needed. Economies had not bothered him when he raised cattle. But as an old age came upon him and he began to look backward, he realized some of the opportunities that had been missed. Much had been wasted, much destroyed, and men would have been richer if they had been satisfied with less. He was this water, unused. An old-time cattle grower would have snorted at the idea of such prudent husbandry. But a change was coming over the world. Such things would be thought of in future. New management was necessary. Perhaps he had a mental picture of a young man going about and changing things according to the new order. New ideas and fresh strength were necessary. It was too bad that these acres lay idle, that this water was unused. When he returned to the house, the men were coming in from the field. They had separated the horses from the two binders, and each man rode a horse. Even Mike and Narcisse had a horse apiece. The tug chains jingled softly, and someone was whistling a tune. The sun had set in its usual brilliance. That, too, was something unused, rarely seen.